In our last lecture, we analyzed a simple circuit containing a sinusoidal voltage source resistor and inductor all connected in series in the time domain and saw that there was a lot of ugly calculus and trig that needed to be done even to get a result for such a simple circuit. We went one step further and used uh, Euler's identity to develop a method that uses complex numbers to solve the same circuit and saw that the math got a little bit easier. Today we're going to introduce the topic of phasor domain circuit analysis, um, which is our last simplification that we'll make for analyzing steady state sinusoidal circuits. So, we started in the time domain, where our excitation signal, V of T, was of the form Vm cosine omega t plus some arbitrary phase angle theta v. We moved to what I'm going to call the complex domain. Because we were using a complex representation of our original waveform. So we had V, but it still varied with time, was Vm e to the j omega t plus some phase angle theta v. Our next step is just a shorthand notation for our complex representation, which we are going to call a phaser. So in our phaser domain, What we are going to do is actually a step that we did in our last example problem. Um, we observed that all of the currents and all of the voltages in our circuit were all oscillating at a frequency of omega. So we had a common factor of e to the j omega t in both our source contribution and our response, and we simply divided that bit out. Well, our representation here in the phasor domain is going to be just that. We are going to do what's called suppressing the frequency term because we understand that if the excitation is at a particular uh, angular frequency omega, then the response will be of that same frequency, and that's just redundant information that doesn't need to be restated over and over and over again. So our phasor domain representation will be no longer have any time dependence because we're getting rid of this term. So it will just be Vm e to the j theta v as an exponential form, or what we're going to more commonly use in um, our analysis, the polar form, Vm angle theta v. So we're going to work a few very quick examples on how to convert a waveform into the phasor domain. So let's say that we have a time domain signal, Vx of t is 12 cosine 377 t plus 19 degrees. To convert this into our phasor domain for a phasor voltage Vx, all we need to do is carry with us the magnitude and the phase angle. So in this case, we have a magnitude of 12 volts. Oh, sorry, this is volts. So we would have 12 angle positive 19 degrees volts. So this is our phasor domain representation of our time domain signal Vx of t is equal to 12 cosine 377 t plus 19 degrees. Now, oops, doing this. Let's say we have 
Vy of t is 11 sine 18t minus 105 degrees volts. Actually. So our phasor domain representation is based on us having a cosine function in the time domain. So in order to get a correct phasor domain representation of this signal, we need to convert this sine function into a cosine function. Sorry, this should, should have been... Well, we can work with this. Um, so to get into the... Uh, as a cosine function, the magnitude isn't going to change, so it's going to stay at 11. And we know that sine is equal to cosine minus 90 degrees. So that would mean we would have cosine of 18t and then minus 105 minus 90 is negative 195 degrees volts. And so our phasor domain representation would be Vy is equal to 11 angle negative 195 degrees. Uh, lastly, we may rarely see a time domain waveform like this, where it's expressed as the sum of a cosine function and a sine function. So if we had 5 cosine 3t plus 2 sine 3t. We can convert this sine function into a cosine function. 5 cosine 3t plus 2 cosine 3t minus 90 degrees. And Performing this mathematical operation actually requires an awful lot of trig identities that are kind of mean and ugly. So instead, we could convert each of these terms into a phasor so that we would have Vz phasor would be 5 angle 0 plus 2 angle negative 90 degrees. Both of these are volts. And then we could use um, our calculator to perform the indicated complex math, and we would get a result that is 5.385 angle negative 21.801 degrees volts. So working in the phasor domain, or in the frequency domain, really just eliminates all of the trig identities that we have to apply and um, you know, memorize and things like that in the time domain, and lets us do just simple complex math to get the exact same result. Um, all right, so the next thing that we are going to do is we are going to develop phasor domain relationships for our circuit components. So let's say that we have a resistor that has some resistor value R. We know that there's going to be some current I of T flowing into the resistor and an associated voltage drop V of T across our resistor. If V of T is of the form Vm cosine omega t plus theta i. We could represent it in the complex domain as Vm e to the j omega t plus, sorry, this should be theta v because we're dealing with a voltage, 
and our current i of t would be of the form i m cosine omega t plus theta i, which in the complex domain would look like i m e to the j omega t plus theta i. All right, so there is a very specific current voltage relationship for a resistor uh, called Ohm's law. Ohm's law tells us that V of T is simply equal to R, the resistor value, multiplied by I of T. Well, if we substitute in our complex domain relationships, this is going to give us Vm e to the j omega t plus theta v is equal to r times i m e to the j omega t plus theta i. If we suppress our frequency terms and move into the phasor domain, then we would have Vm e to the j theta v is equal to r times i m e to the j theta i, where Vm e to the j theta v is a phasor voltage, and i m e to the j theta i is a phasor current. So this is our phasor domain relationship for resistors. It's just Ohm's law using a phasor voltage and a phasor current. One thing that is interesting to point out here is that the magnitude of our voltage phasor, Vm, has to be equal to the magnitude of the phasor on the other side of the equal sign. So Vm is equal to R times Im. Nothing surprising there, but the angle of our voltage phasor has to be equal to the angle of the phasor on the right hand side of the equal sign. And so in a resistor, this means that theta V, the phase angle associated with the voltage, has to be exactly equal to theta I, the phase angle associated with the current. This is a very important revelation um, that we will use uh, an awful lot later on in this class. So now, Using these same voltage and current representations, let's take a look at what happens if we have an inductor. So if we have an inductor with a value of L through which our current I of T flows and generates a voltage of V of T, we know that V of T is equal to L times DI by DT. If we substitute in our complex domain relationships, this gives us Vm e to the j omega t plus theta v is equal to L times the derivative with respect to time, so that's just gonna be j omega I am e to the j omega t plus theta i. Suppressing our frequency term gives us Vm e to the j theta v is equal to j omega l times I am e to the j theta i. Um, and so this gives us the relationship phasor voltage V is equal to J omega L times phasor current I. Now, one thing that I want to point out here is that this J could be expressed in a slightly different way. So if I draw a complex plane where the horizontal axis is my real axis, and the imaginary axis is my vertical axis. Um, J, so, so let's actually start before we have that. So um, the number one, one unit in the real direction, 
could be written in rectangular form as 1 plus j0. Because it's got one real part and zero imaginary parts. In polar form, this is one angle zero degrees, which is the same as one e to the j zero degrees in an exponential form. Well, j, which is by definition one unit up in the imaginary direction, in rectangular form looks like zero plus j1, which is what we have, or it looks like one angle positive 90 degrees, or one e to the j 90 degrees. So if we use this relationship, e to the j 90 degrees, and substitute it in here, what we find is that we get omega L I M E to the J theta I plus 90 degrees. So what this lets us know is that the phase angle of the voltage theta V is exactly equal to the phase angle of the current plus 90 degrees. So these are 90 degrees out of phase. Um, and the, this we will also use an awful lot um, a bit later on in the class. Lastly, let's see. All right. Um, let's work lastly with a capacitor. where we have a current flowing in and a voltage drop occurring over the capacitor terminals. And we know that I of T is equal to C dV by dT for a capacitor. If we substitute in our complex domain relationships, we get I am E to the J omega T plus theta I is equal to J omega C VM E to the J omega T plus theta V. Suppressing our frequency terms gives us IM E to the J theta I is equal to J omega C VM E to the J theta V. Or, just like we did with our inductor, we could express this as omega C Vm e to the j theta v plus 90 degrees, which lets us know theta i is equal to theta v plus 90 degrees. So for capacitors, the current voltage are also 90 degrees out of phase, but it's a slightly different relationship. Um, we can recognize that this is our phasor current, so we have phasor current I is equal to J omega C times our phasor voltage V. So this is our phasor domain relationship for a capacitor. So to summarize those three results, for a resistor, we saw that V phasor was equal to R times I phasor. For an inductor, we observed that V phasor was equal to J omega L times I phasor. And for a capacitor, we observed that I phasor was equal to J omega C times V phasor. When we come back, we're going to use these three relationships to define a new quantity that we will use that will vastly simplify our circuit analysis in the frequency domain.
The next step in simplifying our steady state sinusoidal circuit analysis is to um, develop the concepts of impedance and admittance. So in a DC circuit, for a linear black box network, We know that if we excite our network with a DC source that we can observe some voltage drop over the terminals of our linear black box network and observe some current flowing into our linear black box network and the resistance or the equ equivalent resistance of everything that we see um, inside the linear black box network is given by the ratio of the voltage drop over the network divided by the current flowing through the network, which is just Ohm's law. Well, if instead we have a sinusoidally varying source, or actually a phasor representation of a sinusoidally varying source. Vs. We should observe, or, or, and we can measure the phasor voltage drop over the black box network and the phasor current flowing into the black box network, then we can define what is called the impedance, where the impedance Z which is playing the role of resistance in steady state sinusoidal circuits, is the ratio of the phasor voltage divided by the phasor current. So we get this the exact same way, just using Ohm's law. However, since our phasor voltage can be expressed as a voltage magnitude with a particular phase angle, and our phasor current can be expressed with a current magnitude and a particular phase angle, we can find that our impedance is simply the magnitude of phasor voltage V divided by the magnitude of phasor voltage I with an angle of theta V minus theta I where this bit is the magnitude of our impedance, and this bit we'll consider to be the phase angle of our impedance. In rectangular form, so this is a polar form representation, we could express this as a real part, which we're going to call R for resistance. This is the exact same thing as the resistance that we were using in the DC portion of the class, plus Jx, where x is called the reactance. And we see um, that reactances will occur whenever we have inductor, uh, inductors or capacitors in our circuit. So we have some resistance. And here we have reactants. There we go. So we can now use our definition for impedance. to develop relationships uh, for the impedance of resistors, capacitors, and inductors, since we know the phasor domain relationships between voltage and current for all of those elements. So for a resistor, the impedance of a resistor, which is 
simply the ratio of the voltage divided by the phasor current is going to be simply R, or in rectangular form, R plus J0 ohms, and in polar form, this would be R angle 0 degrees ohms. For an inductor, the phasor voltage divided by the phasor current leaves us with 0 plus J omega L ohms in, po uh, in rectangular form, or omega L angle 90 degrees ohms in polar form, and for a capacitor, ZC, um, we are going to have V divided by I, so that means we're going to have to move this J omega C term to the left hand side, and so we get one, excuse me, zero plus one divided by J omega C ohms, which in polar form becomes one divided by omega C with an angle of minus 90 degrees ohms. Uh, it may not be obvious where the negative sign on this angle comes from, but if we have one over J, and we multiply this by J times J, that gives us J over j squared, where j squared is negative 1, is negative j. So that's why we have an angle of minus 90 degrees. <clears throat> um, the next thing that I'm going to introduce, oh actually before I do that, um, notice please that the units for impedance are all ohms. So what that means is that we no longer have to worry about capacitors in series add like resistors in parallel and things like that because all of these impedances we can treat as if they were a resistor. It's just sometimes a resistor has an imaginary part and sometimes it doesn't. So all impedances, um, so impedances in series combine like resistors in series and impedances in parallel combine like resistors in parallel. Now, our next topic will be admittance. This isn't going to be used an awful lot in this particular class, but when you get into your classes on network theory and things like that, the concept of admittance will come up a lot. Admittance Y is defined to be the ratio of the phasor current divided by the phasor voltage. So it is simply the inverse of impedance. So in polar form, this is going to give us the magnitude of the phasor current, which is just IM divided by the magnitude of the phasor voltage with an angle of theta I minus theta V where we'll call this the magnitude of Y and this the angle of Y. And in rectangular form, we are going to have G plus JB, where G is what's called the conductance And B is what's known as the susceptibility. And I may have misspelled that, but it'll be okay. Susceptibility. So we can develop relationships um, for the admittance fairly easily. Let's go ahead and do that real quick. <clears throat> 
So the admittance of a resistor. So I'm going to divide by V on both sides and divide by R on both sides. And so I get 1 over R plus J0 Siemens, which is just 1 over R angle 0 degrees in Siemens. For an inductor, I'm going to have 1 over J omega L, so that's 0 plus 1 over J omega L Siemens, which is 1 over omega L angle minus 90 degrees Siemens. And for a capacitor, I will have I divided by V is J omega C. So 0 plus J omega C Siemens, um, which looks like omega C angle positive 90 degrees Siemens. And all of these relationships are simply the inverse of the impedance relationships that we got uh, previously. Now, for a generic impedance and admittance, things um, maybe don't map out exactly how you would expect them to. Okay, so what I mean by that is that our admittance or excuse me, yeah, so our admittance Y is by definition 1 over the impedance, which implies that our conductance plus our susceptibility is 1 divided by our resistance plus our reactance. So from this, we can see that, let's see, G, our conductance, expressed in terms of our impedance, is R over R squared plus X squared. Now in a DC circuit, we saw that G should simply be 1 over R, but we don't get that nice and easy relationship anymore which is what I'm trying to illustrate here. Similarly, we can find that our susceptibility B will be negative our reactance divided by resistance squared plus reactance squared. And going the other way, our resistance is our conductance divided by conductance squared plus susceptibility squared. And finally, our reactance is negative our susceptibility divided by our conductance squared plus our susceptibility squared. So for a generic impedance and admittance, these are the relationships that we would use to convert back and forth between the two. All right, so our last thing that we're going to do today is use these concepts to analyze that same circuit that we had been analyzing in the time domain and the complex domain and see if the math works out to be any easier. So uh, our circuit was we had a sinusoidal voltage source, V of T, that is being applied to a resistor in series with an inductor and our goal was to figure out our time domain current, I of T. We used Kirchhoff's voltage law in order to set up our system of, a, uh, to set up things and then substituted in uh, relationships for the current voltage relationship for resistor, current voltage relationship for inductor, and got, uh, got bogged down in an awful lot of math. So instead of doing all of that, what I am positing we do, oh, and just to be clear here, we are expecting that V of T was of the form Vm cosine omega T uh, plus some phase angle theta V 
which we set to be zero degrees explicitly. And we found out that I of T was Vm divided by the square root of R squared plus omega squared L squared cosine omega T minus the arc tangent of omega L over R. This was the results of all of the math that we did. Instead, we're going to work this guy in the frequency domain. So to do that, we are going to convert our voltage into a phasor voltage. So our phasor voltage here, V, will simply be Vm angle zero degrees. And then we will convert our resistance into its equivalent impedance. So the impedance of a resistor is just the resistor value itself. So this is going to stay R. The impedance of this inductor. Uh, so we, before we had um, L Henry's of inductance. Now we're going to have J omega L ohms of impedance. And lastly, we're going to find our phasor domain current, I. So I can actually just use, uh, so previously we had a differential equation, we had to do lots of trig and all that kind of good stuff, unless we used the complex, uh, worked in the complex domain in which we had um, a significant amount of complex math to do. If I'm working fully in the phasor domain or fully in the frequency domain, I can just simply use um, Ohm's law. So what I mean by that is my phasor current I is going to be my phasor voltage Vm angle zero degrees divided by the total series impedance that I see R plus J omega L. <clears throat> So um, this is actually our closed form solution of our result. Now, if we wanted to, we could multiply this by R minus J omega L divided by R minus J omega L and do complex algebra um, to figure things out. And we would actually be able to find very easily that the magnitude of our phasor current, Im, would be Vm divided by the square root of R squared plus omega squared L squared. And we would find that the phase angle of our current theta I is negative the arc tangent of omega L over R. Doing complex math extraordinarily similar to the complex math that we did um, when we were working in the complex domain. The beauty of this is we have a complex number and then a complex number here in the numerator, excuse me, in the denominator, and we have calculators that can handle all of that. So our circuit analysis went from boards full of work to a single line of complex math. Um, so to me, that seems much, much easier. Um, in our next lecture, we will work just several example problems um, in the frequency domain, illustrating how you can apply everything that we've learned in DC circuits. So Kirchhoff's voltage law, Kirchhoff's current law, Ohm's law, voltage division, current division, source combinations, source transformations, nodal analysis, mesh analysis, Thevenin and Norton equivalent circuits. All of that stuff is now fair game while we're working in the frequency domain. And so using these complex numbers, these phasor relationships, we can actually eliminate all of the calculus that we would have had to do while working in the time domain and have converted it into fairly straightforward algebra in the frequency domain. Uh, thank you for watching.